Welcome everybody. Um, I see on the participants, there are a lot of familiar names and some new names. You're all very welcome. Um, this is the second masterclass in our series that's organized by the Transformative Innovation Policy South Africa Community of Practice. And this is a collaboration between the Department of Science and Innovation, who are funding the community of practice, and the Human Sciences Research Council and the University of Johannesburg. More specifically, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Glenda Cruz. I'm the head of the Center for Science, Technology and Innovation Indicators at the HSRC. I'm one of the partners. And then our other core main partner is Professor Erika Kramer Buller. She is the Trilateral Chair in Transformative Innovation, the 4R and Sustainable Development. And also parts of our team on the screen, they can wave, are Robin Williams and Amanda Lee O'Connell. And you will have been getting lots of emails and notifications from them. So you can put the face to the name. Um, so welcome, as I said, you're all very most welcome. And the mask, this is our second in the masterclass series. And what we're trying to do with these masterclasses is to grow and deepen the community of practice. And we're trying to find ways to use and translate and apply the transformative innovation policy models and tools and approaches to our very specific developmental challenges um, in South Africa. And to help us lay the foundation, we need a lot more people who are more familiar with the model and with the approaches. So to do that, we've invited members of the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium from other countries to share their expertise in these masterclasses. Um, just a quick word on the format. There will be a formal presentation for about 45 minutes, but don't worry, it's going to be very lively. And then we're going to open for discussion because a key, Catalina, can you please mute? A key um, goal is for us to be able to engage and think where do we need to stretch and extend and deepen an idea or put it in a different way so that it, the way we talk about it is familiar by our colleagues in South Africa, our fellow policy actors and practitioners. So today we have invited Rob Byrne. We're very happy to have Rob Byrne here. Rob is a core member of the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium. He's based at the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex, which is part of the trilateral chair. So he's also a visiting associate professor at the University of Johannesburg. And Rob draws on a range of academic approaches, such as transitions theories, innovation systems, political economy, and science and technology systems. And he brings them together in a very, very important and useful way. And one of the key ways he brings all those fields together is through his work in the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium. And Rob is familiar with our context. He's worked in South Africa for a number of years, um, uh, participating in running our, our first policy experiment on the living catchments. And he's worked in a number of African countries. And so we asked Rob to, to join us to focus on a core foundational concept for TRP. And the question is, that is socio-technical systems. So we asked Rob to talk about what do we mean by socio-technical systems and why does it matter? And he's got, I don't want to say too much because he's going to explain what a socio-technical system is and why it matters. But he, the way he's tackling it, he's going to give us both a practical and a theoretical view of socio-technical systems. Um, 
and he will give us a set of lenses to understand systems change and coordination and how we can approach how our policy can try to promote transformation in the real world in all its messiness. So the socio-technical systems concept is very key to that. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Rob and he will lead us in learning about the key concept, but do put your questions in the chat, do put your comments in the chat, and do participate when we open up for discussion from your own experience or your own reading or your, an area or an issue you would like to start working on. Thanks everyone and over to you, Rob. Thanks, Glenda. Um, hello everyone. Um, <clears throat> I, I noticed a few familiar names of people joining. Um, and so uh, to those people, I guess I should apologize that you've probably seen some of this before, um, or perhaps it all can sort of act as some kind of revision. Um, but in any case, uh, um, hopefully it will be interesting to everyone in some way or another, and uh, even more, uh, hopefully it will be useful uh, in one way or another. Uh, and as Glenda said, what I, I, I'm going to try and do uh, is to provide uh, what I could call a grounded understanding of, first of all, the socio-technical systems concept. Um, so to start with the kind of practical view, try and think of, of, of uh, sort of technology, let's say, in the real world and what, and what that means for understanding how technology works and, and so on in that sort of in reality. Uh, and then sort of move on uh, and slowly build up uh, some of the fundamental concepts, let's say, uh, associated with socio-technical system theory, and then to focus uh, a bit more specifically then on socio-technical transitions theory and relate that in particular to the idea of transformative interventions or what uh, I suppose um, to the more... Uh, more important to everybody here is transformative innovation policy uh, as transformative intervention. So that's kind of the, the, the three main aims of the class, the master class. Um, and so I'll start with, the, if you like, the why, why a socio-technical systems concept um, is important or useful. Um, and uh, the obvious kind of overarching global kind of uh, ambition around the sustainable development goals is perhaps one of the more um, powerful reasons why um, in the sense that achieving the SDGs uh, I think many of us would recognize requires transformation transformation of all our societies nationally and globally and and, and many other levels uh, and that's a thorough transformation but societies, of course, function in, in very complex ways. And those complex ways include lots and lots of social and technical interdependencies. So if we're going to understand uh, those complex uh, interdependencies, then we would require, or at least the argument would be that we require some kind of systemic kinds of analyses uh, and you know, we can look at uh, systems, technological systems, social systems, etc. You know, what is uh, look at the technical change? What happens with technologies, technical knowledge, uh, policies, and so on? We can also look at social change, which could include cultural practices. Uh, can include the way we do politics, uh, the way power is shared or not concentrated. Um, but also ecological change, of course, because you know, when we think about the SDGs, or one of the things right. that motivates. Uh, it would be good at a certain point. Um, yeah, the, one of the things motivating, or several of the things motivating the SDGs, things like climate breakdown, biodiversity loss, and so on. Uh, but all of these things, at least in the socio-technical systems view, would be uh, they're all intertwined in various ways. They interdependent so so trying to understand all of these things then uh, is if you like the goal of, of taking a socio-technical systems uh, view with the idea of course that if we can understand all of these complexities 
uh, then we have a chance at least of being able to then guide how our societies develop uh, and guide uh, how societies develop in what we might think of as desirable uh, and desirable here can be maybe what is articulated in the SDGs uh, in those desirable and transformative ways. So socio-technical systems theory then is trying to do all of this. Uh, it's very ambitious, but socio-technical systems theory then is trying to understand, achieve this kind of understanding. And uh, particularly if we translate it into something like transformative innovation policy then, uh, to provide uh, guides for action. So that's the kind of why, uh, at least the argument why uh, a socio-technical systems view uh, could be useful. Uh, but to go back to, you know, sort of practical example or to start with a practical example, um, I want to start with this, uh, the idea of offshore wind generators or, or wind farms <clears throat> and think about various aspects that, that need to be in place and working together um, for the technology, let's say, to be considered a success. Um, so very obviously there would be the core technology, um, so the turbine, if you like, the thing that converts uh, wind uh, power, wind energy into electricity. That's, uh, of course, uh, key to all of this or right in the middle of it all. But uh, there are also other components, of course, of the wind turbines, the towers, the blades, the cables, uh, and so on. Uh, all of these various other components um, associated with the core technology. But then the components, the core technology, uh, uh, are all sort of uh, are all supplied through um, particular systems as well, supply chains. Uh, so supply chains need to be working for, you know, an offshore wind farm to, to function properly and for, for us to, to think of offshore wind generators as a successful technology. Uh, and infrastructure around not just the supply chains, you know, the road network, uh, the, the, the vehicles, the regulations and so on around supply chains, but, uh, but the infrastructure, of course, of getting electricity from the wind turbines onto an electricity grid and into homes and factories and offices and so on. Um, and all of that grid work requires management. So there need to be grid management protocols and procedures and people and so on. And, people are involved in all of these things as well. So we're also talking about a skilled workforce uh, and there are multiple skills needed for all of this to work. And of course, uh, particularly if there are markets involved, then we will be looking, or at least the private sector involved, we will be looking to consider a technology successful if it is profitable, or at least some of the actors need the technology to be profitable uh, if they're gonna be involved and continue to be involved. And uh, profitable means that there must be some kind of electricity demand. So uh, again, that's a, you know, a huge uh, part of what gives reason, if you like, for the system to exist. And electricity demand and profitability, if you like, are mediated to some extent by energy markets. So people need to buy electricity, people need to sell electricity. And electricity demand implies electricity practices, what you might call electricity practices. So, you know, the things we do in our homes, the, the kinds of appliances we use and so on, and how those, those appliances fit into our daily lives and routines, uh, we can think of as electricity practices. And associated with practices are, are sort of bigger ideas about cultural meaning. Uh, and if we're thinking here in terms of offshore wind, uh, an obvious sort of cultural meaning comes down to sort of green lifestyles. Uh, so we might be thinking of things like environmentally friendly sources of energy. Uh, and when we talk about environmentally friendly sources of energy and energy markets, then more specifically, we may also be thinking about carbon markets uh, and how carbon markets function uh, in order to be able to promote uh, technologies like offshore wind. But that, of course, needs political support 
uh, political support and social acceptability. Um, you know, it's uh, and well as we see in in, in many of the arguments around uh, renewable energies, in particular, uh, arguments about cost versus the cost of fossil fuels. Uh, we see around issues of social acceptability uh, for some, you know, wind farms, whether they're on land or in the sea, are considered um, un unacceptable. Some people would would argue that, uh, you know, they're a blot on the landscape, or uh, let's say they're in the in in the uh, a wind farm offshore. You know, is in the way of bird migration. Uh, routes, for example, and so that's a danger to, to to nature. And you know, there are many other arguments about uh, associated with social acceptability. Others would uh, see them as as uh, symbols of uh, you know a, a deeper cultural significance of, of, of sort of green lifestyles. So there are many arguments around those, those things. Um, but if there is political support and social acceptability, then we can see then. Uh, the, the introduction and, and sort of implementation of conducive policies and laws and regulations or institutions if we sort of collectively think of them, uh, which of course are also uh, essential for any technology uh, to work, to be considered successful. And then finally, um, the, the technologies uh, and the infrastructures and the, the training of skilled workforce and so on and so on, relies to a large degree on scientific knowledge. And that scientific knowledge, uh, whether it is you know, what we might consider um, basic science or more kind of applied science or scientific methods, uh, is essential for further development and refinement and so on uh, of the technology. So we also have this kind of research and development function. So lots and lots of different things, and we could go on and on and on for the rest of the 45 minutes and probably fill up uh, this slide with, with things that need to be in place for a technology to be considered uh, successful. But I won't go on and on and on and fill up the slide with uh, the various um, aspects that need to be in place. Instead, if we just collect these together, first of all, we can think of a uh, sort of technological dimension that some of these things uh, could be grouped under. We can think of uh, a science dimension. We could put uh, some of the aspects under that. We can think of a policy dimension, put some of the aspects under that. Uh, likewise, a user and market dimension. And finally, we can think of kind of social, socio-cultural aspects. And, and collect uh, some of these aspects under there. And as I say, this is no, by no means an exhaustive list of the things that we could put into these categories. And uh, you might argue that, that these categories are a, um, perhaps a little bit arbitrary or some of the things fit in more than one category or, or whatever. That I think in terms of, of, of the broad idea of a socio-technical concept or a socio-technical system is, is not crucial. Uh, the sort of finer details, um, you know, things we could um, argue about and debate. Uh, but the idea here is to give you a sense of, um, if you like, the complexity of, of how a technology uh, in real life works uh, in practice, if it is successful, and to give a sense of, of when we're starting to think of the socio-technical concept, system concept, uh, the kinds of things that we need to consider and how we can start to kind of organize all of this uh, complexity. Uh, now we'll come back to these dimensions, these five dimensions, technological science policy, user and market and socio-cultural uh, in a few slides time. But before get, getting there, all of these things need to be in place. Now for incumbent systems, the dominant systems that we currently have, uh, they tend to be stable, and they tend to be stable for a variety of reasons. Uh, an important uh, set of reasons is to do with path dependencies, and I'll come back to that concept uh, in a few more slides as well. Um, so here's a list of uh, possible sorts of path dependencies that are at work 
in these stable socio-technical systems. And, and I'm trying to give some examples here relevant to offshore wind and fossil fuels. So capabilities, first of all, the widespread uh, workforce skills uh, and, you know, all of us have our particular skills and knowledge that we've developed from training and, and honed through experience and developed through experience. And certainly in the, in the, 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 the dominant, the incumbent socio-technical systems, we might be talking about millions of people with these kinds of skills. And those skills, you know, some very, very high quality skills are very difficult to change. Uh, I often give the example of myself, uh, you know, I'm, I'm now a, sort of become a, quite a sort of dusty academic, I suppose, uh, and uh, working in a particular area around socio-technical systems and primarily kind of energy systems and energy access. Uh, it would be very difficult at my age in particular uh, to become a medical doctor, to change skills completely and to, take a completely new change of direction, uh, you know, it'd take me five, seven years or whatever of training, if anybody would pay for it. Very hard for me to change uh, the skills and knowledge that I have in any uh, uh, radical sense. And of course, if we look across workforces, we have millions of people, particular skills and knowledge, uh, in some cases, um, years of experience. Those capabilities then, uh, uh, produce a kind of path dependency in the system. Likewise, economic structures, uh, I mentioned supply chains earlier. Supply chains are very complicated things. They're very delicate in some cases, as we've seen with uh, what has happened throughout the pandemic. And now, uh, even more recently with the war in Ukraine, uh, how uh, disruptions to supply chains can be very difficult uh, to overcome because they're very complicated, there's a lot of dependencies in them. Uh, and so whatever supply chains and, and uh, interdependencies there are across different economic sectors, uh, they again produce a kind of path dependency in the system. Then we get into the, into the area of kind of political economy, if you like. So vested interests, uh, politics and power also have path dependencies to do with sunk investments, to do with profit streams and to do with political influence. Uh, again, the, in the fossil fuel uh, sector, we, we, you know, seen years and years of attempts uh, from fossil fuel lobbies to, uh, to disrupt uh, action on climate change. Um, and that, you know, in, in order to protect sunk investments and profit streams and that those activities have happened um, very often through political influence. Plus, of course, there, there, there are these vested interests have enormous power. When we think back to capabilities and economic structures, um, where you've got millions of workers involved, for example, in mining and uh, you know, oil extraction, et cetera, uh, that, that in itself, all those workforces also can, can provide a kind of constituency, a powerful constituency to resist change. So once again, path dependencies and some interactions across the different dimensions here of, or the different kinds of path dependency. Then we have compatible infrastructures. So grid connection architecture, for example, which um, when we think about fossil fuels, uh, large power stations, you know, grids have been have, have sort of evolved and grown up, been installed, are regulated around largely around uh, big power stations that are based on land. Uh, that kind of combat, uh, infrastructure is not necessarily so readily compatible to offshore wind, although it's possible to make adjustments, of course. Nevertheless, it is some, something of a path dependency. Then um, I mentioned also earlier, uh, various kinds of institutions, policies, laws, and regulations, though those, you know, are. If you think about policies on R&D subsidies, for example, uh, you know, there's been uh, some research into how much fossil fuels are subsidized uh, and those subsidies take different forms. Uh, some of them uh, might be to keep fossil fuels cheap for certain populations. And if those subsidies are removed, then we see reactions, understandable reactions, the cost of living 
crisis. Uh, you know how uh, fuels become suddenly much more expensive, and how the how are the poor are supposed to um, heat their homes or cook their food or uh, you know whatever. Um, those kinds of institutions are also very difficult to change. Uh, least cost power sector development policies, you know, going for the least cost energy sources. But those least cost, I put in quotes here because uh, the cost doesn't necessarily include externalities like climate change uh, impacts and so on, in, in, certainly in fossil fuels. So, you know, what is the real cost? Is it really least cost, et cetera? There are questions there. Um, but very significant path dependencies. And then cultural kinds of uh, path dependencies. So uh, technological and user sorts of cultures, uh, we might um, think, I mean, it's arguable, but arguable perhaps, but it seems to me as someone who works, uh, has worked in the energy kind of sector and energy analysis for a long time, uh, people often equate energy with carbon. Uh, and so any attempt to reduce uh, carbon, the carbon intensity of, of energy systems uh, is sort of seen as somehow trying to reduce energy uh, when actually, you know, we can generate energy from the sun or wind or the waves or whatever, various different sorts of sources that are carbon free or very low carbon. Uh, and if you generate electricity from a, a wind turbine, well, the electricity is just the same as if it had been generated from a coal-fired power plant. It, it's, you know, the, the, there is no difference in the electricity. It's just a, the method of, of creating it. So, so this equation of energy and carbon is, is a kind of a technological cultural phenomenon to my, to my mind. Um, but then in terms of user cultures, we, we, we have uh, certainly uh, many parts of the world kind of electricity dependent lifestyles and, and actually um, in many other parts of the world, ambitions to achieve electricity dependent lifestyles. And so those, the, that sort of cultural dimension itself has a sort of path dependency, which again, reinforces the stability of the current systems that we have. And then thinking across all of these, uh, they all interact with each other, these social, technological, material, and uh, if we think of particularly about politics, the discursive processes, all reinforce one another. If there are attempts to change one of these power dependencies, we tend to see a kind of resistance against that change from the other uh, sort of path dependent processes. They're all sources of stability, but at the same time, uh, these incumbent systems themselves are under pressure that there are sources of instability. Uh, so things like climate change, environmental change uh, can create pressure on uh, this stability can destabilize the dominant or incumbent systems. Uh, social pressures, which, if you like, can translate um, <clears throat> something like climate change into uh, protests to do something about climate change. So we, we can see social pressures in the form of climate protests. Uh, sort of demography or, or, or demographic related uh, kinds of pressures. So climate, climate protests, but with a particular force, uh, as we've seen in recent years, where um, young people have been mobilized in particular, you know, very concerned about their futures and, 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 and willing to act um, sort of very, very decisively uh, to, to, to force policymakers in particular into climate uh, action. Uh, there are also development ideologies and challenges to those. So uh, following the financial crash, 2008, and, and uh, kind of various other um, quite dramatic uh, impacts across the world since, uh, you know, various challenges to the belief in market-based solutions to climate change. Uh, the market-based solutions are still very much uh, the primary solutions, the main solutions, but there are many uh, many other challenges to those uh, to that assumption now. Uh, and then various internal dynamics and contradictions in these stable systems. So uh, we can have perhaps we, well we can arguably see confused kinds of responses to uh, climate change within uh, the fossil fuel 
systems. So on the one hand, there may be climate science denial, which is, perhaps is diminishing, but is, but is still there, versus the same companies um, talking about how they are uh, addressing climate change and uh, sort of leading to what uh, can be criticized as, as green washing. Uh, and likewise, on a, let's say on a technological level, uh, rhetorical support for things like carbon cap capture and storage, which uh, if it were to work, could, could mean that fossil fuels could be continue to be burned uh, and just capture the emissions but actually little investment from the fossil fuel companies themselves in carbon capture and storage uh, technologies. So it's sort of strange kind of contradictions and confusions going on there. And in ad addition to all of these things, of course, we get major events, natural disasters, wars, and so on, which uh, themselves can also uh, put pressure on these incumbent systems. Any or all of these uh, pressures then can lead to instabilities. And those instabilities then uh, can provide opportunities um, for alternatives. So if we think about fossil fuels, the alternatives might be wind power or solar power and so on. So very obvious one in this example is climate change. Uh, how, does, how do the fossil fuel systems deal with climate change? Well, they, they're trying various things, but uh, obvious alternatives would be uh, renewable energies. Now we can, recognizing that these pressures can destabilize, in quotes, because I recognize that that's not necessarily a favorable term to use in policy um, circles, but, but recognizing that, that this kind of destabilization can happen, we can deliberately then use policies and programs of activities to, to deliberately, in quotes again, destabilize these incumbents and or promote alternatives. So at this point, I want to get slightly more uh, conceptual and give you some of the uh, conceptual basis for the theory. Um, hopefully it hasn't been too conceptual so far, but uh, it's going to get a little bit more so now. So um, first of all, technology. In, this, in the kind of socio-technical system concept, technology is not really just the discrete artifact that we see. It's not just the wind turbine. Uh, but actually that artifact is in, embedded in a complex social, economic and technical system. Uh, and that system then can be conceptualized as a technological regime. And here's just one definition. There are many definitions and this one perhaps you know, isn't complete. It's quite comprehensive in a way, but it, or it's, it's certainly extended, but, uh, but one could argue that it should include other things. <laughs> But here, um, the definition is that the technological regime is the whole complex of scientific knowledge, engineering practices, production process technologies, product characteristics, skills and procedures, established user needs, so it goes beyond the technology and the producer, regulatory requirements, institutions and infrastructures. So it's, it's a fairly big definition um, and it's a, in a sense is a very big idea, the technological regime. Additional fundamental concepts then, one that I've mentioned several times now is path dependency, which in very simple terms is, it says that the options available to us now have been conditioned by what we've done in the past. So me as a dusty academic, very hard to become a medical doctor. That's a kind of personal uh, sort of life path dependency. Um, Co-evolution, the independent changes of two or more processes, I'm sure that's, that's obvious to everyone. And bringing those two together um, and thinking about uh, an additional concept of positive feedbacks, which is included in this, this definition, there's the idea of lock-in. Uh, so that lock-in is a path-dependent, co-evolutionary process involving positive feedbacks among technological infrastructures and the organizations and institutions that create, diffuse, and employ them. With all of that in mind, if, we, if you can keep all of that in mind, we can then move on to uh, how all of this translates into or gets used in 
a particular socio-technical systems concept, which is socio-technical transitions theory. Uh, and here I'm, I'm just going to focus on the idea of the regime and what does a transition mean when thinking about regime. So first of all, regime. So looking back to the example of offshore wind uh, turbines and farms, uh, we had five categories of various aspects that were listed. The sociocultural science, policy, technological and user and market uh, dimensions. Now these are drawn as often symbolized in, in, in uh, transitions theory in this kind of solid pentagon. The idea being that the, the, these five dimensions are in a sense locked together. They, they support each other. Uh, and over time, they each develop along trajectories that um, reinforce each other. So we have this idea of these arrows representing how these uh, particular dimensions um, develop over time. Uh, and altogether, we can see that that is representing the ideas of co-evolution, path dependency and lock-in. We have a very solid uh, kind of regime, very powerful in the language of transitions theory is socio-technical regime, uh, i.e. the dominant or incumbent socio-technical systems uh, that we see across uh, our societies. The idea then in transitions theory is that we need to break this somehow uh, in order to tra transform it, change it. Uh, and it, and it is the new regimes that we're looking, new regimes which hopefully are more sustainable that we're looking to uh, promote, develop and uh, secure and establish. And so the transitions concept then is that uh, we're looking to understand how to change from one socio-technical regime to another and the other being the one that hopefully is one that's gonna help us achieve sustainable development goals. That's the regime part, and that forms, if you like, the centerpiece of transitions theory. So sort of organizing now the complexity of everything else referred to in, in the previous slides, when we think about uh, things like pressures on the regime, uh, and we think about trying to, to, to find new ways to do things that are more sustainable, we get into uh, what's called the multi-level perspective or the MLP, which organizes all of that complexity. So we start, first of all, with the, the regime, let's say you know, fossil fuel-based power stations, uh, electricity grids, <clears throat> the appliances in our homes uh, that use electricity and many, many other aspects, as, as we mentioned earlier about uh, you know, what constitutes successful technology. So socio-technical regime, that sits at the center, and that's the dominant system of serving whatever the societal function in, in, in mind is. And then we have the context of the regime, which is uh, called the landscape. And that's all these other kinds of sources of pressures that in general are sort of very difficult to influence uh, directly or change directly. Um, so we see the, the impacts of climate change, for example, or uh, you know, very more recently, of course, the, the onset of the COVID pandemic. So all of these things are operating, as it were, in the landscape and can cause pressures uh, on, the, on the regime. But the new technologies or new uh, practices that we are looking to foster uh, and so on to, to replace the, in this case, unsustainable regime, operate in what's called socio-technical technical niches. So these are places, the niches are places where we see experimentation with new technologies and new practices. Uh, and hopefully we learn and try and develop these, these new, these novel technologies or practices uh, into a form that can replace the regime. That's a kind of snapshot view of it, giving the three levels of the MLP. If we now bring in the time dimension again uh, and uh, think about uh, the changes in at these on these three levels over time, we get to this beast of the diagram, 
uh, which uh, Frank Hales and uh, I think is mainly responsible for, um, where we see in the middle here, um, there's, if I get my pointer up, um, we see in the middle here, the regime idea, okay? And it's kind of st stability as, as time progresses. Here where the arrows, break up is supposed to represent what happens when an external pressure has an Im impact on the regime. So this is kind of trying to convey the idea that there's a searching process going on here. How do we address this, this external pressure uh, and yet survive? This would be you know, actors in the regime. Down here in the niche, we see perhaps in the early stages of experimenting with a new idea that there is no real direction uh, or stability. There's a lot of searching and trying things out and experimenting. But over time, uh, as we learn more and more about a technology and a practice in its context, so we see a, an increasing kind of stabilization. Uh, and if our uh, niche technology or practice is stable enough, and coincides with this sort of instability in the regime, there is a chance that it can replace, or at least um, play a part in, but perhaps replace entirely uh, the old regime and establish a new one, in this case, the renewable energy regime. In the, once this has been established, there is a possibility that there may be other uh, kinds of experimentations going on in the niche, but because we have a new, stable, hopefully sustainable regime, that this one actually fades away uh, and becomes a failed uh, niche. And of course, ultimately, uh, the idea being that we have an impact back into the landscape, in this case with climate change, that it is mitigated when you reduce the impact. Very, very quickly, that's the kind of idealized theory uh, about um, socio in socio technical transitions theory. But if we now want to look at, well, how do we make use of this understanding in terms of trying to achieve some kind of policy interventions? This is where we can now get into uh, transformative innovation policy and particularly this approach, which has come out of. Uh, tipsy in particular, uh, using the idea of transformative outcomes. Now, you, you can, uh, I've given the references I've used uh, at the end of these slides, and you're um, certainly welcome to have the slides, so I have no problem with that. Uh, so you can go to this paper by Gosh et al. Um, from last year uh, to read much more of the detail about transformative outcomes. But essentially what they're intended to do is to help actors guide their interventions and their evaluations of what they're doing uh, when they're trying to practice transformative innovation policy. Uh, and these transformative outcomes have sort of come out of and very closely related to socio-technical transitions theory. Uh, and there are 12 of them, 12 outcomes. I'm not gonna go through all the 12 outcomes, uh, but they fall into three categories of action, each category having four outcomes. Now, I'm sure this is not going to be the last word on transformative outcomes, that they may well uh, be developed further and change over time. But as things stand at the moment, the three categories are these, building and nurturing niches. And there are four outcomes associated with that um, ambition. Uh, I'm not going to talk through them. But then the, the second category, expanding and mainstreaming niches, uh, likewise, and again, it's very four outcomes associated with, with that ambition. And then the third one, unlocking and opening up regimes. Again, four more transformative outcomes associated with those. What I'd like to do as a kind of uh, final uh, um, sort of part of my presentation before summarizing um, is just to overlay some of these, one, one example from each of these categories overlay some of these transformative outcomes on the NLP that we just seen. So going back to the NLP, uh, I'll just get rid of that fossil fuel regime um, word there to 
reduce the clutter slightly. <coughs> um, what we can do is we can we can think of um, we can look at this and see how we might use transformative outcomes uh, or at least some of them uh, as a way to try and promote the in this case renewable energy niche or in particular solar PV as I put it here um, while also destabilizing um, the regime. So first of all, we might think of the user and market dimension of the regime and how we could protect uh, what might be expensive for now solar PV systems from uh, sort of competitive forces, you know, competing with other energy technologies, fossil fuel based energy technologies. So we can provide, for example, subsidies for rooftop solar PV. So that provides a sort of protection or shielding against normal market pressures and gives solar PV an, op an, uh, an opportunity uh, to compete uh, with these other technologies in the marketplace. So, so users, consumers, householders, etc., uh, can uh, afford to choose solar PV uh, as opposed to fossil fuel based um, energy generation. We can also at the same time try and create, for example, standards for solar PV installations that um, so while people might be able to afford solar PV, they may be worried that uh, there are no standards or that they don't know what to expect or they don't understand what's available in the market. We can um, sort of help that out by creating standards. So that reassures people there is you know, some, uh, some comeback if there are problems and so on that, that you know, sort of helps to legitimize the, the technology, let's say. Um, and in terms of uh, destabilizing, we can, for example, create a coal phase out policy. So we could uh, sort of implement all three of these uh, interventions at the same time. On the one hand, destabilize the regime, but make an alternative available that is affordable and um, hopefully reliable and somewhat standardized as part of trying to achieve a transformation of, in this case, uh, a kind of electricity uh, production and consumption regime. At least that's the idea. Having said all that, there are a few caveats I'll just um, point out. Uh, First of all, that socio-technical transitions theory um, has been developed um, almost overwhelmingly, really, uh, in Northern European context. So using Northern European experiences and histories. There is some work uh, that is being done in Southern contexts. And interestingly, that work then is yielding challenges to the theory. We can talk about those in, in the the discussion afterwards, if you wish, uh, but but you know it, it does at the very least the application in southern context does at least question some of the assumptions, uh, particularly around the regime concept. Also, um, it is uh, let's say it's easy when when thinking about the idealized transition explanation that that NLP and how change happens, the theory of change there it can misleadingly imply linear change processes. So it, it sort of conveniently uh, ignores some of the messiness of change, um, but that's why it's called an idealized um, explanation. The idea being to at least get the, the, the sort of key uh, elements of the change process understood, but real change processes of course are much messier. Uh, and the idealized explanation I gave actually is, is one of uh, what some people would say would be many different sorts of transition pathways. Um, I think in paper that is uh, cited um, by Hales and Schott uh, from 2007, I think has seven different uh, possible transition pathways. There isn't space to go into all of them here, but it is to do with the ways in which the landscape level uh, changes, the regime uh, 
sort of stability or instability and the nature of those uh, st stabilities and instabilities change and the timing of any kind of niche developments, how those interact can create different sorts of transition pathways. And then finally, the centrality of technology in this theory uh, can create this kind of techno-optimism or a sort of techno-determinism. Uh, and, and it can be quite easy to get sucked into to thinking only of technocratic solutions. So, you know, introduce so PV and um, everything will be fine. When actually, of course, we do need to recognize that the transition process or processes are not linear. They're not clean. They are messy. There's politics and power involved. Uh, there's pushback and so on. That that actually much more is needed in any kind of any, any of these interventions than simply a new technology, no matter how well it works. Okay, and then just a few points to summarise. Then um, hopefully I have made some of this clear at least that a socio-technical systems view at least tries to capture the complexities of interacting social and technical dynamics. And uh, at least the argument uh, for those of us in, working in this kind of theory would, would be that it provides a strong basis for analyzing these kinds of complex changes. And then particularly thinking now uh, about the use of things like transformative outcomes uh, provides a, at least an evolving basis for designing interventions to achieve transformative change. But this kind of analysis has been so far under applied in southern context. So there is there's work going on here, and there's lots to learn. Uh, there is work in, in Asia and Africa, and even some in Latin America. And there are insights emerging from that, which I think are, are going to be uh, important. Um, but there are still questions, and, and I think perhaps some of you on the call who have uh, worked in the uh, living catchments project and our attempts to kind of uh, see how do, how do we translate these ideas into the context of the ambition in that project um, you know there are questions around how these ideas translate from the northern to southern contexts and also actually in that in that, in, in that example of the living catchments how we how we translate the concepts from this very technology centered theory to one that actually is more about uh, a, a kind of um, community of practice uh, uh, type kind of change. Um, and so there's something useful to learn there. And actually, this is something that perhaps is relevant to this community of practice as well, that we could think of this community of practice as, as a sort of a niche, a, a niche of uh, new policy practice. And, uh, and, and, you know, there are questions there, how would you of interesting to me, um, if, if not to you, how would you conceive of this ambition for transformative innovation policy community of practice as a niche challenging a regime of policy practice? Uh, and uh, perhaps more importantly, how to actually replace um, the traditional, uh, as it were, innovation policy practice with this transformative um, innovation uh, policy. Um, okay, that's it. Um, there's a few uh, references there, uh, which if you do get the slides, you can follow up on. Um, and finally, thank you. I have to say I've heard lots of discussions on TRP, but that was hands down the best. <laughs> it was clear. It showed us in our own everyday experience the complexities of change, and then you explained the concepts. That was absolutely excellent. Thank you. And I think um, you, you ended off by saying, how do we see the, ourselves in this community of practice um, as trying to propose alternatives to replace traditional policy making, innovation policy making. So we'll open that as a question. But what I think you have done is, um, you know, in South Africa, we, we tend to design policies and we somehow think they're just going to happen. 
And then we started to develop log linear models and theories of change. But I think in the way you've explained it, you've shown us this complexity and the multiplicity, and you've shown us what's possible to do with the tools, and you've shown it why it's of value. But what I also like at the end, you brought a critical lens and you've raised the question, where might we need to interrogate those concepts and adapt them or stretch them or translate them or extend them to be able to make sense and use them in our own context. So with those introductory words, I'm going to throw open for discussion. One of the things there is, is, is perhaps that policy being so closely, I suppose, this is a bit of a guess, but being so closely related to politics uh, and um, how, let's think about one of the, it's probably the wrong word, but the easiest way into to starting the change process, um, or one of the easier ones, it, ways in is through politics and and creating um you know what we would call narratives about change and in fact one of tipsy's ambitions has been to change the narrative um that by creating a a, a narrative a positive constructive narrative about about what the future could be if we were to follow a particular kind of new approach um, that that starts to build uh, the kind of political and social support and acceptability that then creates space to actually do things differently uh, and spend money differently to experiment with different ideas so that that becomes a way in um, and associated with then um, you know getting a foot in the door in that sense is is and getting some resources to actually experiment in practice as you are doing in the living catchments project is that you can then start to generate evidence um, along with the learning that you do in in the context of actually trying to to do this in practice you generate evidence that shows it works and that evidence then can help you sort of strengthen broaden and build a niche uh, if we stick to that language uh, and stabilize that niche. Um, and, and so it becomes um, more likely in time um, to be uh, a credible, real alternative to uh, whatever the mainstream sort of, in this case, policy practice would be. <clears throat> and the reason I, I'm asking, or as it were, giving Blanche a heads up, up here is because her PhD thesis, uh, in a sense, or at least part of her PhD thesis, thesis was exactly on this, looking at uh, the rise of renewables in South Africa. So I don't know, Blanche, if I, I don't want to put you on the spot, and please don't uh, feel obliged to give an answer, but, but uh, you know, I'm sure you could add um, more insights to this um, if you wish, but please don't, you know, don't get me off the hook. It's, it's... Um, yeah, so maybe just to provide some context. Um, so with that specific paper that Rob's talking about, I looked at which dimensions of the regime were used by the incumbents to resist change. So in that specific paper, I wanted to understand because it was around 2015, 2016. So there was a lot of delay of the renewable energy program with, with South Africa. So I sort of deconstructed the dimensions between social and technical dimensions, it's what, what Rob has presented. So on the social side was very much discourse narratives. On the technical side, it was more about, um, you, know, you know, which renewable or which technology such as renewable or, or when that was actually being supported. So on the social side, what was interesting is because I think it got to the point where load shedding became so prevalent that everyone actually, because I, if, I mean, load shedding has been around since 2008, but I think eventually, I think there's no South Africans that are left that don't know load shedding. So by 
2016, I think open discourse, meaning the debates, the understanding of why we have Loshing, that was more presented out in the open, you know, so everyone had so, some sort of um, say in, into what, um, of the failure of ESCOM. So I think that this course, that narrative opened up um, a lot more people um, to, to try and really understand what was the failure or why we had such a crisis. So it's sort of to answer Rob's question, the social side started, and but also the other dimensions also started um, opening up. So I guess sort of destabilizing the regime in a way, opening up and unlocking those um, resistance really, it helped on the, on the social side. Thanks. Thanks, Blanche. Um, in a way, I think it's also um, uh, one of the examples that I keep thinking about is the way with COVID, we've all turned to this, this natural disaster has pushed us all to adopt this technologies of Zoom. And then now where the policy, the innovation policy would be coming in is to regulate whether people work from home or have hybrid policy models of going to office, um, changing all the infrastructures around your, um, your, for your digitalization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think for the policymaker, the socio-technical system adds by alerting us to all, to the complexity and all the dimensions we might need to take into account. Um, yeah, okay. Well, first of all, on innovation, <clears throat> um, I think, yeah, TIP is, is kind of bringing this definition, if you like, or understanding what is innovation. That's, it's, it's kind of bringing that to the fore. <clears throat> um, and that it is that innovation doesn't necessarily have to only be thought of in the sort of traditional, if that's the right word, traditional sense that that would be used in uh things like the oecd and innovation surveys and so on where they look at you know um, products processes organizational change marketing uh relationships with stakeholders these kinds of things in private firms that we could think of innovation more broadly i mean it's, it can be dangerous to think too broadly because it starts to become meaningless but but if if at the heart of innovation is is essentially about uh, achieving, trying to achieve solutions to problems. So it's a kind of problem solving and uh, introduction of uh, solutions, even if they're not, you know, the end of the story. Uh, then that process or those processes are, you know, applicable in all kinds of. Uh, um, parts of our lives um, from very personal things that we try and you know innovate in our personal lives to uh, kind of social innovations about how we organize ourselves socially and politically uh, and so on so in that sense you know and I'm certainly uh, let's say a fan of expanding the idea of innovation to, to, to and using what we understand about how innovation happens <clears throat> from you know learning from the, from the private sector and all the research has been do, done on how innovation happens in firms to actually expand that and consider um, innovation in a broader sense. Um, <clears throat> and that is then that can get us fairly quickly into practice rather than product or process. Um, but thinking then about, about regimes and niches and tensions and, and so on, um, the first thing I suppose in in in, the tra in transitions theory, the assumption would be that if if the change is being instigated from within the regime, it is most likely to be uh, an incremental change rather than a transformative change. <clears throat> Whether that assumption is is entirely valid or not is is debatable. But considering you know all those path dependencies, it can be very difficult to think uh, from within the regime, if you are benefiting from it uh, in its current form, 
can be very difficult uh, to think beyond uh, you know the, the usual way of doing things <clears throat> not impossible and some actors in the in the regime who might be considered regime actors may indeed look for much more radical uh, change or transformative change <clears throat> I don't know I can't think off the top of my head of, of examples of that but it's possible um, and in terms of thinking about about niches kind of bottom up or, or coming from sort of public sector policy initiatives and so on I think it's probably fair to say that most most niches begin actually with very bottom up uh, kinds of um, practices evolving in different in places. So wind power is is a good example in in terms of what we think of as, as uh, modern wind power. Wind power has been in use uh, for you know centuries. Uh, but in terms of uh, generating electricity, you know, lots of experiments in Denmark, farmers experimenting with uh, using um, uh, electric generators and connecting sails and and uh, and so on to the generator to gen to generate electricity from the wind, um, and that eventually then becoming a much more kind of formal process of of. Uh, innovation as we would understand it traditionally and moving into private sector firms getting government support and so on <clears throat> so that was uh, very much an example of sort of bottom-up niche work which then gets taken up uh, sort of in, in more kind of formal processes uh, in my own research looking at solar pv solar home systems uh, in uh, kenya and tanzania uh, that there was a kind of combination. So from uh, solar systems become, solar PV systems becoming available in East Africa, in a sense started as a primarily US funded activity to replace oil in the, in the US energy system, dependence on oil because of the, the oil shocks in the 1970s. Uh, the development of, the, of solar PV then experimented uh, in African contexts, and then people in those contexts taking up this and and uh, experimenting with the idea of running their homes using solar PV, and then the solar home system, as we currently understand it, evolving in that sense from the bottom up, and then being taken up again by sort of more traditional formal actors, World Bank and so on, to fund. Uh, larger experiments with, with solar time systems and many other experiments since. So a kind of combination of, of top-down, bottom-up, uh, translation across context, sorts of things going on. So also examples of, if you like, how it, this isn't necessarily always a simple kind of linear process, that it does have these different sorts of dynamics, uh, translates across different contexts, quite messy, Etc. Etc. <clears throat> that answers the questions. Um, yeah. I, I, well, first of all, to go to this kind of idea of, if I if I understand Harsha um, well, kind of sort of avoidance of risk <laughs> uh, in the public sector, um, which I. It's kind of it is a it is a problem, and yet it is the only sector, if you like, that can really take risks. So it's kind of a there's a bit of a I don't know sort of what a word is there, but it's a sort of conundrum in that. Um, and what I mean there is that that um, unless we, if we're talking private sector, very large companies with big R and D budgets who can who take lots of risks in terms of of developing new ideas. <clears throat> The public sector has at least the potential to, you know, give grants and try stuff out in a way that private sector is very unlikely to do. Uh, and we do see that. And it, uh, some of, let's say, the, the you know what would be classified as aid funding uh, does do some of that. But at the same time, we have this. Um, there's kind of rules on. Um, uh, accountability of where money goes and whether it's 
successfully spent and so on and that goes back to the kind of project um, standard sort of project criteria for success and how they those kinds of standard criteria can be a, a, a real constraint on the sort of experimentation that may need to be done in order to find a transformative uh, directions and, and solutions so there are and there are other kinds of uh, issues like this so there are problems here and this is the, the idea of the niche is is that you is, is to recognize that you need uh, a sort of protective space that you that if you really want to achieve uh, change transformative change and not just a kind of incremental business as usual sort of change that you have to take risks and though and you, you might be able to start small experiment with an idea and then gradually develop it but you need to protect that space <clears throat> and that needs resources of different kinds which includes money uh, but it can also be political resources you know the political will to support the experimentation and and a big problem we have uh certainly in many countries across the world is sort of arises out of things like new public management where uh you you know everything must be measured and you know everything has to produce results and if it doesn't then it's you know it's a failure versus let's say things like uh the sort of tolerance we have in or the greater tolerance we have in the research world where you do research uh in in a much more open-ended way ask a question and see what you find out and so it's about learning that projects if you like we need, we need to sort of rethink projects more in that form of asking questions and learning than seeing projects in and of themselves as solutions uh, so there's a very very significant change that we need to try and nurture somewhere somewhere somehow <clears throat> i don't have the answers to how the to do that but you know things like the living catchments project uh represent for me uh something of a model of of what that could look like where uh there is at least uh, as far as i can tell sufficient support to nurture this quite transformative idea uh, and allow it the space to evolve <clears throat> those in the project might argue differently i don't know um and this is a problem then when we get to go back to the private sector the private actors are you know they might take risks but the risks they take will uh, they will be expecting the returns to come to them and one of the other sort of aspects of niche uh, development is that lessons are shared and knowledge is shared and so this is a problem then if you want to rely on the private sector to do this work because it is not really in their interest as they would see it i would guess to share learning uh beyond kind of you know the confines of the firm so there's a problem there potentially you can have some kind of private public collaborations partnerships maybe is not I'm not sure whether they work particularly as partnerships in a, in a, in a very tight sense, but, but certainly collaborative work uh, where you might have a significant element of grant funding from the public sector that supports private sector work. Uh, but as a kind of requirement of the fact that it has public money is that lessons can be shared. An example possibly uh, where this has happened, I, I'm not entirely clear about the details but might be something like uh, the pay-as-you-go business models um, developed uh, particularly in kenya around soda pv where uh, yes there were private firms involved in developing the, the kinds of technologies to to to, to have this kind of pay-as-you-go version of solar home systems but there was also public money involved and learning from those experiments i think has been shared at least to a degree and we see a kind of explosion in the pay-as-you-go model you know it has its good and bad features but it but but certainly the kind of replication of that model uh which now goes well beyond 
East Africa, where it was uh, first kind of experimented with. 